Dunjo. My name is Two Feather, and my background is that my mother was Apache on my mother's side. It comes from a long line of healers. And on my father's side, I'm Austrian. And on my father's side, we come from blue bloods because uh, and when we trace my family history, we were a baron in Austria. And one night our loyal people came and said, tomorrow morning your family will be slaughtered. There's going to be a military coup. So on my Austrian side of my family grabbed everything they could and left in the night and came to the new world over here in America. So I'm traditionally trained 10 years by three teachers in uh, Native American healing arts, which I call faith healing. You can call it anything you like. Uh, it was very tough training because in them days it was still old school. If I made a mistake, I felt pain. And I'm not talking the kind of pain you think about. I'm talking about the physical pain. And if I made a sound or a word or a gesture, I would have pain on top of that pain. So I take my first pain and accept that. Uh, I, as a trainer of healers and also a trainer of spiritual warriors and spiritual warfare, I, I do three-day spiritual warrior training camps. And I've been doing this for over a decade. So it's been a rewarding journey in many ways and it's been a challenging journey in many ways. Dealing with sick people all the time, all the time is a lifestyle that I've accepted without any false beliefs of what it may be or may not be. My teachers took great pain to make sure that I knew that if you can't take the heat, don't get in the kitchen. So I accepted that walk in life and I accepted a life that's different than most people where you go have a job and have a retirement and you have a couple of kids in a beach house and a you know, condo timeshare in Las Vegas. And they said, you won't have that, my son. So if you're willing to accept this path, then it's yours. And this is, I accept. I'm going to take a moment and go into the future. I'm going to put my spirit into the future. And these are the things that I see for the future as a natural evolution. As we come from dinosaurs to cavemen to modern man, and then we go past that into the future where I'm going to go now. And what I see is a completion of the circle. Because a circle has no beginning and has no end. The circle always is. And that's what we're dealing with, what's here and now. But for this exercise, I put myself in the future. And what I see is that circle returning back to the beginning, which there was no beginning, actually, but I'm putting myself in that place. And the beginning is that this false deity, these false idols that have been put upon us these days, like money and power and all of these kind of things in my time in the future don't exist anymore. So how do we get to this place? How, how do we evolve back to the place where we came from? When the, our brothers and sisters came from across the pond to Turtle Island, <clears throat> We didn't have any money. <clears throat> of course, we had challenges with the chief and the medicine people and the hierarchy of warriors. We had this kind of thing, which is, I believe, ingrained in who we are as human species. But the actuality that I envision and that I've actually seen in my dreams is a society without money. And the word challenge has really diminished in its importance because we, we need challenges as part of life because when we have a perfect circle, it's always in harmony and balance. Where's the growth? So as one of my teacher reminds me, there must be sand in the circle. And when we put that little granule of sand and we get that little hiccup and then we get to explore our different pathways and our journeys to get that kind of growth. So how do we get to this place in the future when there's no money? How, how do we do exchanges? I mean, how do we live our lives? And how, how do we function on a daily existence? Well, the facts are, it's so simple that people just have a hard time seeing it because people have a need for complicated this and that so they can wallow through all the bushes and finally get to the, to the end of the journey. Well, I'll take you right to the end of the journey, and it's simple. Instead of working 40 hours for the man, for the company, 
for the greedy people who need all their money and power and stuff. Instead of doing that, how about if we work 40 hours at our passion? And because we have uh, archetypes in our society, with the different archetypes in our society and with the word passion guiding us onto the things that we're going to produce, what better product can we have than the one that was produced with passion instead of another incentive, which would be green money or red money, depending what kind of country you're in. What kind of incentive is that? I mean, you can't even take a dollar bill and take it to the bank and turn it into something because the silver certificates have been taken away from us. I mean, what are silver certificates and what's money anyway? It's just some machine that some boss guy says, keep printing money. And you keep printing money, printing money, and someday the tires are going to hit the road, believe it or not, accept it or not. So in this society of the future where we are working some designated hour that we come to an agreement, you know, in a, in a conscious effort as a group, which is some people would say voting, but in the traditional native world, we don't call it voting because our hierarchy structure does not uh, condone democracy. Our higher leadership does not condone communism or even socialism. All of them isms is nothing to us. What it really is, is leadership by council. And the council are the ones that have long white hair who've walked around the medicine wheel and they fell down because they didn't tie their moccasins up and scrape their knees and they got up and they learned they got to tie their moccasins up before they walk around. So these elders have walked all the way from the east to the south, to the west, to the north and now they're sitting in the north, the place of long white hair and knowledge and wisdom. They have in their heart the want and the desire to give us their children the best they can give us and through their experience and through their walk on life they have discovered the best path to get on to attain that goal and in that path and in their decisions when the council of elders make their decision the word is final there's no voting there's no lobbying there's no interest groups there's nothing they're just the council of elders but i believe the council of elders the way it used to be and the way that it's evolved to now in the future is more representative of the people because a lot of times the council of elders are the males, which is well and fine. But when the council of elders make decisions that affect all people, they affect all people. And who are all people? They include the grandmother medicine as much as the grandfather medicine. So I believe that in the tribal council, it's mainly made up of the masculine energy now, should also include the grandmother medicine. And I'm not saying half grandmother and then half grandfather. I'm not saying three quarters grandmother and one quarter. I'm saying that each individual uh, sector of the society who condones and who sets up this type of tribal leadership thing will have to make up their own minds about what kind of percentages happen. And so in this world of the future, it's more of a, I'm a hunter, so I go out, drop an elk, bring them home, and I don't sell the elk by the pound or by the kilo. I give the elk first, take care of your family. When your family's taken care of and there's something left, the rest goes to the rest of your community. In the native world, we say that it takes a whole village to raise one child, and it does. And you say, well, why doesn't that village have a police department? Mm. I wonder. Where's the need for a police department? Because when a young person does something that's bad, like steals or does something, uh, damages somebody else's product or takes jealousy to a level where it interferes with other people's peace and freedom, that young child represents not only their mother and father, but their aunties and uncles and all their cousins and all their relatives. Because that means that their aunties and uncles didn't teach this young person well enough to show them that stealing is not the way to do things. 
and that causing damage to other people's property or coveting your neighbor's goods is not the way to a harmonious living situation. So in that, with our society now that we've evolved to, it's kind of like Star Trek. <laughs> I love Star Trek. They need food, they just put the little food replicator and you never see them in the, in the community room giving money for food or drinks. It's all just there because everybody's pursuing their passion. So here's a path to enlightenment and what is it that we're really looking for in this world? I believe there's several things, but one of the main things that I find that we seek is fulfillment. And so you go back to the old society, the way I used to work on money and working for companies and the big rich guy and rich gal, you know, raised their kids and sent them to Notre Dame and they all got nice new cars and big old houses and everything. But there's still this empty part inside of them that they're seeking something. And they don't even know what they're seeking, but they know something's missing. And what is missing, and they'll go to Buddha, and they'll go to Allah, and they'll go to Jesus, and they'll go to Yahweh, and they, and they just can't find it. Because it's, their words are, it was doggy dog, we, we stepped on everybody on the way up, and now we made it to the top. But when they have a party and invite the people, nobody comes. Unless there's a big screen raffle, and then... There's a trip to Bahama raffle, and then everybody see that, and they come to the party because they want to win the big screen, not because they're friends, because they don't really like this rich guy, because they got him kicked out of their job 19 years ago, you know, and they had to go do hand-to-hand -hand stuff. So in this society of the future, if we take the time to put our mindset in that place, which I'm doing right now, I'm looking at where we came from, how we got there, and then where we're at. So, I like to consider myself a reasonably intelligent human being. And in that bit of reasonable, I don't really see the society going from a money society to a non-money society. That's a little bit too much of a transition, I believe. It's like I was in Cuba when Fidel uh, let his brother take over Raphael, and Raphael says, uh, whatever his name was, says, okay, we're now going to let the TV stations come into Cuba. And we're going to let everybody have cell phones, and everybody can go into hotels now, which with Fidel, you couldn't do that. And man, what a mistake. Because when you have that pressure cooker with the rice cooking, if you just let it off, everything goes off. But if you just open it a little bit and let some steam come out, then you give everybody a chance to make that transition. But when you just slap them like that, I was in China before the Olympics. They had the Olympics a few years ago and they were fixing up all the sidewalks and they were making people really stop at the red lights because people in China driving around wouldn't stop at the red lights and you couldn't make them. But now that all the foreigners were coming in to see the Olympics, they had to enforce it and the policemen were standing there giving people tickets for running red lights and they're going, hey man, why are you giving me a ticket? I've been running this red light since it's been up. Yeah, but now we're having foreigners come here, you know, we have to put a nice view out to the rest of the world, you know, that we're a society that follows rules. So until the Olympics are over, you're going to have to stop at the red lights or you're going to get a ticket. So that's that transitional phase right there. And that's why I and then other futurists, social designers, which I call myself now, but before I met Jacques Fresco, I didn't have a label to wear, but then I met Jacques Fresco. He's 96 years old, one of the most intelligent human beings walking the earth that's still alive. Uh, he has a project called the Venus Project, and he wants to go to a moneyless society too. But I'm not talking the Bill Gates kind of moneyless society where you have a little chip on your thing, you know, not that kind. I'm talking about the true moneyless society and he wants to jump to that, and I believe too. But we have other like enlightened thinkers like Roger of Albuquerque, and he doesn't like me to mention his name, but he's also a social designer. And we are of the, Roger and I are of the light that we need to have a transitional society with the goal to get off of money. And in that transitional society, with that goal, with that will, put out to the universe, we're now allowing that to possibly manifest, we can take this transitional society, get into it, live it, 
fold down and scrape our knees, figure out what we need to figure out, and then get on to the goal, which is the moneyless society. And the natural evolution of man, to me, says, where else can we go? We can't keep printing money. We can't go keep going into people's backyards and telling them how to live their lives. We can't be holier than now. Everybody needs to have their own journey. But if we're journeying to the same place, that is a beautiful thing. And the same place being the moneyless society. And I believe that's the natural evolution of man. You have the DuPonts and you have the Rockefellers and you have this Illuminati and you have this world uh, United Nations and you have money. And to me, all of this stuff is demonic. And, you know, I'm a human being trained as a spiritual advisor and I have my opinions about things and that is my opinion that money is evil. And you'll hear it by some religious people that money is the root of all things, evil things. And that's what I truly believe. I truly believe it. I have to have it just like everybody else to pay gasoline in my car or to put food on the table, okay, and I'm living in this, or once upon a time I've lived in that society. But now that we're in a future society where we don't have these kind of needs anymore, I find that that weight that's been taken off of our shoulders is such a, it's beyond revelation, it's beyond a feeling, it's now the productivity of each individual's passion contributing to the whole for the good of all. And when there's no more money and there's no more power and politicians and stuff like that, then it takes away this facade, this false illusion that that's something that's desirable. Because in, in our walk of life, what's desirable is to raise your family in a good way and to be a contributing member in your community and to live in a good way and with a good heart. So I could turn that into 25 cent words because I have a degree in industrial psychology and I have a graduate degree, but I find that this type of thinking this mentality is not only for English-speaking people, it's for all people in the world. So, and because I've been around the world 14 times in so many countries, I understand the challenges in translations. For example, in Japan, when I'm talking about a sacred site, which is, we have in the native world, sacred sites that do different things, the medicine people would take somebody with a heart disorder to a sacred site where the two ley lines intersect, electromagnetic, electromagnetic energy lines intersect within that anomalous area that the vibrational frequency, the foundation that we stand on is changed, that's conducive to heart healing. So that's an F or F sharp for the heart. So if you have a hole in your heart or palpitations or angina or a broken heart or anything like that, I would take the person to that sacred site, set them down, smudge them with the smoke from some sage, and put some sweet grass smoke around them, and guide them onto the path for their discovery, because I know what their discovery path answer is, but who am I to tell them their answer? They need to have the journey, so they can appreciate the answer, because they found the answer. I didn't tell them the answer. So, when I say, when we take a person with a heart disorder to a sacred site that vibrates to the vibrational frequency of F or F sharp. They don't know what I'm talking about. Well, my translator will say, when the medicine man takes the sick person to a holy place, then spiritual things happen. And oh, now we know what we're talking about. So the, uh, the ley lines, to me, are just the universal truth. In Aboriginal, where I spent 14 months in Australia, and I studied with the Aboriginal Kadachis out in the bush, and they call them song lines because they can hear them. And that was my big question when I went to Australia. When you guys go on walkabout with your orange diapers on and barefooted with no shirt, and you're gone for months, how do you know where to go? Where are you going? What are you doing? And they said, all right, Mike, it's simple. We just follow the song lines. I go, what's the song lines? 
well, you know, it's these little, like, you call them roads or freeways, you know, and we can hear them and they sing to us and that's how we travel around and we get to a certain rock and it turns and we put our little mark on there and we turn and then and that's how we go on a walkabout, mate. That's, wow, man, song lines. Well, we call them ley lines and I call them whatever you want. And then when I was in China for four months with the goal of hunting down the government so I could get my books, uh, five books, called the Book of Spirit into the school system and the government. And in that journey, I met an expert on um, dragon mines. And when I heard the word dragon mines, I go, could you please explain that to me, dragon mines? Well, you know, there's like this energy that goes around the earth and it goes this way and that way. And sometimes it's wide and sometimes it's skinny and sometimes it's thick and thin. And they're called dragon lines, and they help us in our spiritual path and in our journey to the other dimensions and other worlds. And I go, dragon lines? Well, in Australia, they call them song lines, and in America, we call them ley lines. And in Turtle Island people language, there's more than 500 tribes, you know, that are still acknowledged. And we have our own words. Which, so there you go, you know, the universe. Well, what I found on these 14 times around the world and all these other countries is the truth is the truth no matter what no matter what frequency you vibrate at no matter what skin color no matter what money you use no matter what language the truth is the truth and I discovered that in New Zealand with the Maoris because these guys paint themselves with tattoos all over their face they're big warriors you know and they're always going around going like this I was like what does that mean and I don't want to ask them make the lead person over here. I want to ask a real Maori warrior really in New Zealand. So I was over there in New Zealand. And I was at the place of the hot springs where when they kill somebody in war, they put them in the hot springs for three minutes, this volcanic thing, and when they come out, they can eat them. So I was there and this guy walked by with this big neck and tattoos all over his face and these big muscles, you know, and he's walking by like that. And he looks at me and I look at him and I go, Tanjo, and he goes, man. He says, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm looking for a flute. Oh, a Maori flute? I go, yeah, because they're just round tubes with no holes in them. They're really hard to play. So I already had held 10 in my hand and, and attempted to play them, and I couldn't play one. And he goes, I'm a flute maker, and I have this flute that just wouldn't be finished. And now I know why, because it's for you, my Apache brother. Come to my house. So I went to his house, and we were sitting on his patio, and he showed me how to play it. And first time I played it. Unbelievable. Ten flutes. I, they showed me how to do it. I just couldn't make that flute make a sound. And he goes, that's your flute, my friend. Thank you. And he kicked it to me. And he said, there's a song in the mountains. I go, oh, yeah? Explain that to me. He goes, well, he says, you, you choose your song where it begins and where it ends. I says, okay, I choose that mountain and I choose that mountain. He says, okay, which one's the biggest mountain? And I said, the one in the middle. He said, okay, that's the deepest note. He says, which mountain top is the smallest one? I said, this one over here. He goes, that's your smallest note. So you got the mountain tops, you got your highest note, your smallest note, and then you can arrange the other mountains to have the note that's appropriate. And I said, that's exactly what my teacher taught me. We call it beaver medicine. And he goes, really? I go, yeah. And at that moment, this light bulb went off in my head. The truth is the truth, no matter what. Here in Maori, who has no contact with my teacher, Native American here in the Southwest, telling me the same thing that my teacher had trained me. So the conclusion that I brought up was, the truth is the truth no matter what. And then I started thinking about the dragon lines and the song lines and the sacred sites, and then boo, it all just, it was like a firework show. My walk has been teacher, but as a traditional faith healer, for 15 years, this is the world that I chose to walk in. And now as the five books has been written, called the Book of Spirit, which I should be releasing on eBooks and Amazon pretty soon, is a series of 27 books. So that means there's 22 more books that are gonna be written. And 20 books have already been laid out, but two books have not been shown to me yet. So we're looking forward to the rest of the series. Um, as a teacher and as the label that I've been given that I'm here to wear a spiritual advisor 
as a spiritual advisor, that's part of my walk on this life, to facilitate people between their spiritualness and the walk here in our 3D world. And I would just like to say a word about our spirit. Our spirit, to me, is something that cannot be divided. You could call it a soul or energy ball or whatever. There, there's no little chunks you can take out and put off into La La Land and say, oh, well, I'm going to go off to La La Land and go retrieve your missing chunk and put it back here and super glue it with some stuff. But we believe that the spirit is one thing that is immortal. And I believe that that Ponce de Leon search for the cup of eternal life was really the epiphany of knowledge, understanding that we are a spirit having a physiological walk so we can learn the lessons that we need to learn so that when we evolve past this world onto the next world, which we call the happy hunting ground, that when we evolve, we could be clean, we could be pure in thought, we can be the best that we can possibly be so that the birds of a feather will flock together. Thank you very much. Please visit my website. It's number two in the word feather, twofeathers.com. Though I haven't touched it for 10 years, someday a web god or a wet goddess is going to come along and square me away. But the book should be available there as well. I also have a spiritual chess game called The Great Mystery. It's a three-level chess game where 12 shamans battle it out with 12 bad guys. And um, this spirit that we have that's housed in this, the housing will go back to where it came from, from the dirt and the water. And the spirit will evolve and evolve and evolve until the time that all the things we needed to have this solid enough foundation to evolve to the next level, which we call the happy hunting ground. And the theme of the happy hunting ground is simple. There's a river that at every bend it gives food or blankets. So when we leave this place and there's always food or blankets on the mystical river, we don't have any competition because we don't need to fight for food or position because when we're cold, we just go to the river and put a blanket over ourselves or we go to the river and eat. And then we have time to pursue our passion, which is the world that we now live in it's past your world of monetary, it's past your world of material places, and now come to my world where we're at now, the world of the future, which is the world of oneness. This is what it's really all about. All of our relatives, the one-legged people, the tree people, our relatives who are the rock people, our relatives who are the wing people and the ones who live in the ocean. These are our relatives. And when we evolve to that place of oneness, when we understand that we're not an island unto ourselves, that we're part of the big picture, what a feeling of relief and what a sense of who I am. We can have, because it's all there for you, if you choose to take that path. I'm not here to tell you what path to take. I'm only here to show you where you could go. The rest is yours. It's your journey. Danjo, shikakui dai.